Hello and welcome to this lecture on semi-definite programming. We're going to talk about a lot of stuff. This lecture is going to be dense. And the reason why is that we're going to first start off with a general picture, that is convex optimization problems with generalized inequality constraints. We're going to see when such problems align with the traditional convex optimization problem. Next, we're going to see what a conic program is and what linear matrix inequalities are. Following conic programs and LMIs, we're going to talk about SDPs, which are semi-definite programs, and many of its similarities with LPs, linear programs, and SOCPs, second-order cone programs. And last but not least, we're going to give two important examples of SDPs that are eigenvalue and matrix norm minimization problems, respectively. So without further ado, let's get started. Right, so before we go ahead and define SDPs, we're going to introduce some inequality constraints that are general in the proper cone sense. So in lecture two, we talked about proper cones that are convex, that are cones, first of all. So what is a cone? It's a set of linear combinations where the weights alpha 1, alpha 2, down to alpha n are positive. This is a generalization of a convex set where the weights don't need to add up to 1. So the weights are relaxed to be just positive. They need not add up to 1. So in that case, you get a cone. Now what is a proper cone? A proper cone is a cone which is convex, closed, solid, and pointed. We talked about this in details in lecture two. Now, given convex cones, we can go ahead and define generalized inequalities over the proper cones, k. So a function is said to be k convex, where k is a proper cone, if the following inequality is satisfied. That is the inequality for convex functions as you know it, but the inequality is with respect to the proper cone. That is, the guy on the right minus the guy on the left falls inside k. So when I go ahead and say x is less than or y in the k sense, this is the equivalent of saying y minus x falls inside k. Now the same thing here, we could minimize a cost subject to generalized inequalities with respect to different proper cones, ki's, and an affine constraint. So here, my f0 is convex. It's just convex, not with respect to any proper cone. It's just convex. However, my fi's are ki convex. So these type of problems are referred to as convex optimization problems with generalized inequality constraints. Because that's what it is. The, the inequalities are further generalized with respect to proper cones, ki. Now, if we go back to the standard form of a convex optimization problem, this, in fact, is a special case of what we have here by setting ki to be the space r plus. And not just that, many properties are shared between this problem that you see and the standard form of convex optimization problems, that is, any sublevel set and the optimal set are convex. So this is common between generalized inequality constraint problems and the standard form of convex optimization problems. And two, any locally optimal point is globally optimal. Three, this optimality condition right here that holds for the standard convex optimization problem also applies here. That is, if F0 is differentiable, then optimal condition is x is x star or x opt, the optimal solution, if and only if the gradient of F0 at x star or x opt transpose with y minus x star is positive for all y that lie inside the feasible set. So all those three results still hold for the convex optimization problem with generalized inequality constraints. 
And as we will see later on in this course, convex optimization problems with generalized inequality constraints can often be solved as easily as ordinary convex optimization problems. The ones that look like this, where Ki's are all set to R+. Plus. So one example of convex optimization problems with generalized inequalities are the conic form problems, or simply cone programs, which have a linear objective function that is minimize C transpose X, and one inequality constraint function, so subject to Fx plus G, assuming k is zero, with respect to the proper cone k. Since this is affine, then it is also k convex, okay? And one additional affine constraint, Ax is b. So this is a special case, or the simplest case, of a convex optimization problem with generalized inequality constraints. Now when k, the particular case when if k is the non-negative orthant, then this problem simply boils down to an LP. So here we'll have the traditional inequality or pairwise inequality since this is a vector at x plus g. So we're back to an LP. So c transpose x, gx less than h, ax is equal to b. So my g is the f, my h is the g, and ax is equal to b is still there. Okay, so that being said, we can view conic form problems as a generalization of LPs. So if you recall, in linear programming, we had two forms. We had this guy right here in standard form. So minimize C transpose X, where X is positive component-wise, and AX equal to B. Well, the same thing we can say right here. Usually people do the distinction between two types of conic form problems. So we have a conic program in standard form that is minimize C transpose X subject to a non-negativity constraint, but this time with respect to the proper cone K and an affine constraint AX is equal to B, right? So this is one. And two, we have an inequality form LP, right? So a linear cost but this time only with the inequality constraints, so no affine constraints. So we have the same thing here, program an inequality form. That is, minimize C transpose X subject to Fx plus G less than zero with respect to the K proper cone. Okay, so that's it for now on conic form problems or cone programs. So before moving on to SDPs, that is semi-definite programming. Let's talk a bit about linear matrix inequalities. So a linear matrix inequality is an inequality or a generalized inequality of the following form. Given a vector x with entries indexed by a subscript as such from 1 to n, a linear matrix inequality is defined as follows. So each component of X is multiplied by a matrix, let's say A1, X2, a scalar times A2, a matrix, down till N, Xn, An. Now, this whole guy is on the left-hand side of the semi-positive definite inequality, less than B. So this means that B minus all this guy is positive semi-definite. This is a generalization of an ordinary linear inequality that is of the following form. So the extreme case is when my A's and B's are scalars, that is x1a1 plus x2a2 down to xn a n. This is nothing other than a classical inner product, that is x transpose a less than b or A transpose X less than B, right? Now, if we denote by the left-hand side as a, as a matrix function, A of X, then this set, that is A X less than B, is convex. Why? Because the inverse image of the positive semi-definite cone under the affine function, F of X is equal to B minus A X, is convex. 
Now, linear matrix inequalities, there's a whole bunch of literature on it. They're widely used in control theory, signal processing. Started in 1890 when Lyapunov published work on his theory. That is in particular when he showed that the following differential equation, that is dx of t by dt, where x is a vector, function of time, equal to ax of t. Lyapunov actually showed that this equation is stable. That is, all its trajectories converge to zero. And when does this happen? It is a necessary and sufficient condition for that to happen is that when there exists, so this guy is stable, if and only if, so I'll put a double sense arrow, if and only if there exists a P that is positive definite, right, such that A transpose P plus PA is less than zero in a positive definite sense, okay? Now, this condition, if you will, is what is known in control theory as the Lyapunov inequality on P, right? So it's a Lyapunov inequality defined on P. Lyapunov also showed that this first LMI, this is an LMI right here, right? So Yepinov also showed that this first LMI could be explicitly solved. It has an explicit solution. And how is this solved? You just, you know, you pick a symmetric matrix, that is Q is equal to Q transpose, that is also positive definite. And then you, you solve for A transpose P plus PA is equal to minus Q, right, for P. This is easily solved. You can just express this equation as you can use the flat operator and then use least squares. So this is this is trivial. Now for this, you get a p that is positive definite, and thus the system is stable. That was the first let's say appearance or application or theory around LMI. So this was around the time of 1890. After that, there was another major milestone in 1940 by some people in the Soviet Union. Let's name a few here. So you've got Lur, you've got Postnikov. So around that time, those people applied Lyapunov's method to some specific practical problems in control theory, especially the problem of stability of a control system with a nonlinearity in the actuator. So for those of you that don't know, an actuator is actually referred to, in simple terms, as a mover, right? It allows a certain system to simply move. So an actuator is a device that needs to be controlled in a proper way or else your system will explode, it won't stop when you want, it might exceed a certain uh, acceleration, it might explode, you never know what happens, so it requires proper control handling, let's say. Now, that was where those two guys and some people in the Soviet Union came in and said, our mission is to apply the stuff given by Yapunov to a system that has an actuator, but it's not a simple actuator. It's an actuator with some nonlinearity. Now, although they did not explicitly form matrix inequalities, their stability criteria have the form of LMIs. So they derived some formulas to ensure stability of the system. Some conditions of the LMI form have to be satisfied. And back then, you know, there wasn't that much fancy computers and stuff. So their inequalities, they used to expand their LMIs, right? Then you end up with some polynomial inequalities that had to be checked by hand. So with that being said, Lur, Kosnikov, and others were the first to apply Lyapunov's method to practical control engineering problems. So yeah, that was their, say, period of time. Now after that, it kind of start becomes but more interesting, in 1960, around that time, you had three solid men out there. You had Yakubovich, Popov, and 
karma. Now those people, along with others, of course, they have reduced the, let's say, the conditions required by lure to simple graphical criteria. What is called now the PR or positive real lemma. This gave rise to lots of criteria. Let's name a few. We have the Popov criterion. We've also got the Circle criterion, Sipkin criterion, and many others. These criteria could be applied to higher order systems as well. Actually, some of those papers, let's say the ones by Yakubovich, is actually in Russian. Many of his papers and books were in Russian. Now, the PR lemma and extensions were intensively studied in the later half of the 1960s and were found to be related to the ideas of passivity, the small gain criteria introduced by Zames and Sandberg, 1965, something like that. Now, by 1970, it was known that the LMI appearing in the PR lemma could be solved not only by graphical means, but also by solving a certain algebraic Riccati equation. So we can't talk about control theory without mentioning Riccati. This guy is a pioneer in control theory thanks to his equation, which are usually referred to as R equations, simply A-R-E. Now, the algebraic Riccati equation should not be mistaken with the Riccati equation, which is a solution to a first order ordinary differential equation that is quadratic in the unknown function. We're not talking about that. We're talking about the algebraic Riccati equation. An algebraic Riccati equation is a type of nonlinear equation that arises in the context of infinite horizon optimal control theory in continuous or discrete time. In continuous time, it has the following form. So A transpose X plus XA minus XB R minus one B transpose X plus Q is zero. This is called the care continuous R and you've also got the dare discrete R that is of the form X is A transpose X A minus A transpose X B multiplied by R plus B transpose X B inverse by B transpose X A plus Q. Now here the unknown matrix is clearly X and A, B, Q and R are known real coefficient matrices. Now those are related to the Riccati differential equation, of course, and there has been a lot of work on these type of equations until today. So that's it for a brief history on LMIs. Now it's time to talk about SDPs. That stands for semi-definite programming. So what is an SDP? If we go back to conic form problems, and if we define K to be the cone of positive semi-definite matrices, then the associated conic form program is an SDP. That is, we're going to minimize a linear cost in X subject to an LMI, linear matrix inequality, X1, F1, plus X2, F2, down to Xn, Fn, plus G, less than zero in a positive semi constraint. Okay? This is the general form of an SDP. Now, the extreme case where all the associated matrices F1 down to Fn and G are diagonal, then the LMI is just a set of linear inequalities. Because if all this matrix right here is diagonal, that is pairwise diagonal F1 down to G, then a necessary and sufficient condition for a diagonal matrix to be negative definite in this case, because it's less than zero, is that all its diagonal components, they have to be negative, right? That is to say, X1, let's say F11 plus Xn, Fnn, plus Xn, Fn1, plus G11 should be negative, down to the N, X1, 
F1n plus X2 F2n down to Xn Fnn plus Gnn should be negative. Then you get a you, you just get Fx is less than G, where F is a suitable matrix in terms of diagonal components of F1 down to Fn. So in that case, if F1 down to Fn and G are simply diagonal, then we get an LP. Because really, this the LMI reduces to a, a set of n linear inequalities, and thus a linear program. Now, as we saw in LPs, that we have two famous forms, that is standard form and inequality form. So we have the same exact thing for SDPs. That is, we can express an SDP in standard form. Now you have a, you've got affine constraints and a non-negativity constraint on the variable. The same thing here, but this time our variable is a matrix. So X is a positive semi-definite matrix, okay? It's not a vector anymore. And in this time, we're minimizing the trace of Cx subject to the trace of Aix is equal to Bi, okay? Where we've got P of such constraints. This is an SDP in standard form. As we have the LP in inequality form, that is, It is just this form without the affine constraint. That is, we minimize C transpose vector x, not matrix this time, subject to x1, a1, down to xn, an, less than b in a positive semi-definite sense. Uh, we've seen the case where an SDP could be expressed as an LP it's when all the associated matrices are diagonal. We can also express an SOCP, that is a problem of the following form, we discussed this in previous lectures, we can express this problem as an SDP. How? Let's write an SOCP here. So in, in an SOCP, you minimize a linear cost in X subject to second order cone inequalities that are inequalities of the following form, IX plus BI, L2 norm, less than ci transpose x plus bi, and we've got m such constraints. This we already discussed, and it's to no coincidence that an SOCP could be expressed as an SDP because an SOC constraint is actually a positive semi-definite constraint because this could be expressed as a generalized inequality on Ki. That is, we can express this as a conic form program as such. In conic form, we're minimizing the linear cost subject to the following generalized inequality constraint on cones Ki, in which the second order cone is defined as follows. So it's a pair yt and rn plus 1, where the norm of the first n components an L2 norm is less than the last component. So if we apply this to this, we get this. It's easy to see the norm of the first n components, that is AI x plus bi, is less than the last component, ci transpose x plus bi. You can also express this in a positive semi-definite constraint, that is, in SDP, this would look like this. So again, we're minimizing a linear cost subject to the following block matrix being positive semi-definite. We've got n such constraints where on the block, I've got an identity multiplied by ci transpose x plus bi. This is the identity matrix right here. And a scalar right here, ci transpose x plus bi. And on the sides, I have AIX plus BI, and it's transposed right here. Now, why is this the equivalent of this or this? Why does this constraint give us the same thing as the above? It's due to 
Shure's complement. So for those who don't know about Shure's complement, a block matrix, A, B, C, D, as such, where A, B, C, Ds are also matrices, then I could express the inverse of M in terms of simpler block matrices. Let's put it that way. And those simpler block matrices consist of Shure's complement. That would be a Necessary and sufficient conditions on this block matrix such that it is left to be positive semi definite. And what are those conditions? He tells us that if I am given a matrix of the following form A, B, B transpose, C, which is what we have right here, my A is this guy, and my B is this guy, right? B transpose will be this and my C is this. Okay, so this matrix is positive semi-definite if and only if A is positive semi-definite and the surest complement of M with respect to A, that is in our case expressed as C minus B transpose A inverse B, is also positive semi-definite. So both of those conditions is the equivalent of this. So now the question is, does the blue constraint give me those two constraints? Or even more, do they give me the SOC constraints and the SOCP constraint problem? Yes, they do. Why? Well, let's, let's write it down. Let's, let's plug in what we have here. So my A is the green guy right here, that is. CI transpose X plus DI, which is a scalar, multiplied by the identity matrix, is positive definite. And when does this happen? It's, it's positive definite only when each and every one of the diagonal components is positive. That is, CI transpose X plus DI are positive. Now, this inequality is actually part of this. It's implicit. Why? CI transpose X plus DI is greater than an L2 norm term. That means it has to be positive. So there's no problem with the first condition. Now let's go to the second one. Let's plug in C. So my C is CI transpose X plus DI minus B transpose, which is AI X plus DI transpose A inverse, that is CI transpose X plus DI multiplied by I, all inverse with a AI X plus BI has to be positive semi-definite. Now this is a scalar, you can verify this term right here is a scalar and all this has to be a scalar and thus this is the traditional non-negativity or the positive constraint. So and another thing here to notice is that the inverse of a diagonal is, is nothing other than another diagonal matrix by taking the reciprocal of its diagonal components. So we get right here, CI transpose X plus DI minus, this CI transpose X plus DI is a scalar and it is inverted, so it is extracted to the outside as such, CI transpose X plus DI, and the inverse of I is again I, and I multiplied by anything as itself, so I, we don't need I in this expression, we're left with AI X plus DI, all transpose, by AI X plus DI is positive. Now multiply everything by CI transpose X plus DI, you get CI transpose X plus DI square minus the CI transpose X plus DI here disappears and this guy is a norm because we have a vector transpose itself, so it's an inner product, an L2 norm, AI X plus DI, an L2 norm square, positive. Rewriting this in simpler terms, we get, now if we apply square root on both sides, we get the SOC constraint. Finally, this is the equivalent of this, or even this, okay? A quick example right here could be eigenvalue minimization. So let's say I'm interested in the following unconstrained optimization problem. That is, I want to minimize the maximum 
lambda max, the maximum eigenvalue of the following matrix, A of x with respect to x, where A of x is the same as we used in the LMI, that is A0 plus x1, A1, down till xn, an, where each of my ai's are symmetric and of dimension k by k. Right, so the first thing we'll want to do here is to write this in epigraph form. That is, let's say I have that, say I want to minimize this time with respect to x and a scalar t. I'll minimize t, I'll do the traditional trick we did, so less than t, and then instead of minimizing this hard expression right here, I'll minimize the upper bound, t. And then I'll say, subject to this inequality, whatever it is. So lambda max, a of x, less than t. Okay, so we have this problem right here. Is it convex? No, right now we don't see any convexity or whatsoever. Um, but could we express this as an SPP? Well, yes, why? Because the lambda max of a of x could be expressed in an alternative form. Um, actually, this condition is the ti, t scalar multiplied by an identity, is in a positive semi-definite sense greater than a of x. As simple as that. And why is that? By using the definition of positive semi-definite, this is the same as saying for any vector alpha, well, alpha transpose ti minus a of x, I'm going to denote of x for now, multiplied by alpha, so alpha transpose here and alpha here is positive. Now by choosing alpha to be the eigenvector corresponding to the maximum eigenvalue, right, this could be v max transpose ti minus a v max be positive. Then v max, then expand this, you get t, the norm of v max minus v max transpose a v max. Now using the definition of eigenvalues, this guy is lambda max v max, and since lambda max is a scalar, it's as such, and we're left here with v max transpose v max, which is the norm of v max to be positive. Now divide by the norm of Vmax on both sides, you get t minus lambda max is positive. And there you go. t is greater than lambda max back here. So this guy is saying the same thing as this guy. Let's give another example on matrix norm minimization. So this time I'm interested in minimizing the L2 norm of a function of x, that is the LMI. A of x is 0 plus 1a1 down to xnax. Now using the same exact trick, we could say that a of x is less than t, minimize t this time, so minimize t subject to the inequality that is a of x and L2 norm less than t. Now first let's let's square on both sides and then let's use the fact that a norm of a matrix squared is nothing other than a transpose a. So this is the equivalent of a transpose, or more formally, a of x transpose of a of x is less than t squared, but this time i. As we express the SOCP as a positive semi-definite inequality, we're going to do the same thing here. It turns out that if you stack in a block matrix as such, then this inequality right here is the equivalent of the following. So a ti right here, another ti right here, and a transpose of x right here, and an a of x right here. This guy is positive semi-definite. So we've got a linear cost with a positive semi-definite inequality. Let's rewrite it. Minimize t subject to ti right here a of x, a transpose of x, and the ti. All this is positive semi-definite. And the equivalence is here. So a matrix norm minimization, an unconstrained one, is actually the equivalent of this SDP right here. Right, so that's it for this lecture. We did pretty much a lot of stuff. 
we started off by defining a convex optimization problem with generalized inequality constraints. That are inequality constraints with respect to proper cones ki right here. Next off, we talked about conic form problems or cone problems, and we showed two different, let's say, forms of conic programs that are in standard form or in inequality form. They're just LPs but with respect to proper cones. Okay. Next off, we talked about linear matrix inequalities and we gave a brief history of where it all started by Lyapunov, followed by its applications in the Soviet Union and especially by Lur and Postnikov. Then in the 60s, there was a lot of simplifications and geometrical interpretations of LMIs, especially by Kalman, Popov, and Yakubovich. Then in 1970s, we saw the R, that are algebraic Likati equations, and in particular the care and there the continuous and discrete versions of the R. Following LMIs, a natural problem to propose is this SDP, namely the semi-definite program, that is a minimization of a linear program with respect to LMI constraints. Also, we showed two forms that are in standard and inequality form. We've seen how an LP and an SOCP could be expressed as SDPs, right? Following this, we saw two examples that are unconstrained initially. In essence, the eigenvalue minimization problem and the matrix norm minimization problem. So that is it for this lecture. I hope you found it beneficial. Please leave a like on this video. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Make sure you subscribe to this channel to receive further notifications of the channel. I'll see you then.